about the network because it's been raining all day in it's been raining all day in Lagos. So I'm just going to share my screen. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amelia. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to the British Leadership Foundation for inviting me um, to be a part of your online post-COVID post -COVID online series. It's always a pleasure to share um, and to talk to people about some of the things that are on my mind, some of the things that I've observed, um, and some of the things that are happening around the country and beyond. So I'm going to share my, my screen so that you can see my slide. Uh, but I'd like to appeal to everybody um, as much as is possible to please put your microphones on mute permanently um, so that your individual activities do not uh do not distract us um and what we are trying to do here this afternoon so please put your um put your your microphones permanently on mute so that your individual activities do not um affect the rest of us can everybody see my screen yeah you may want to you may want to ask them to use the chat box to use the chat box to communicate, yeah, so we can communicate. Well, can, everybody, can everybody see my screen? I'm, I'm, I just want to be sure that you can see my screen so that I can start. Um, yes, so you can, you can send the chat. Yes, yes, I have. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to TBLF for the opportunity. Um, we're just going to share on the theme, Rethinking Program Design, um, this afternoon. Yeah, it's afternoon. The day is far spent already. Um, and over the next 30 to 45 minutes, we'll consider um, the following. We would look at um, program design basics. Um, we'll look at decision-making considerations, and we'll look at new realities. And I'm just going to explain why I've identified these three modules. I've identified them because it's one thing for you to be proactive with um, the, the way you manage your program. And this can, this, this not, doesn't necessarily have to be a development program, but I mean, just for application purposes. No matter how well you redesign your program at a time like this, um, if you do not put yourself in the shoes of your partners or your stakeholders um, or your funders, then you are going to be walking a solo journey. So that's why we're looking at decision making considerations. And then we look at the new realities. What are our new realities at a time like this? Um, and what should we do um, as development experts or as project managers or as program managers um, to achieve our objectives? So look at three quick modules. I have some recommended text that I will share. I, I, I mentioned one or two of them in the course of the presentation. Um, I'm not sure we'll have the time to go into case studies, um, but again, we can do one case study together um, towards the end, and then we can have general discussions. And I'm hoping to spend a lot more time having these conversations with you um, before we call it a day this afternoon. My name is Emilia, I've been introduced, but I just want to quickly speak about my work with development because um, <laughs> I've heard people um, ask sometimes, oh really, I, I didn't know you work so much in development, so most of the time. Um, so my work in development is not as emphasized as you find my work in communication or in sustainability. But over the past decade or more, I've done a lot of work with in the development sector, designing startup plans, serving on advisory boards for non-profit organizations. So I've done a lot of consulting on program design, program management, uh, monitoring and evaluation, partnership strategy, reporting and communications a lot um, for the non-profit sector, the development sector as it were. But these things are not as emphasized as the other things that I do. Uh, because most of the time, um, it, it, the, the non-profit uh, partners and clients, uh, most of the time, they do not um, 
leverage and amplify their work um, as they should. Um, so, so yes, that's that's unless it's a clear cut communication campaign. So very quickly, what's the, the first phase we're looking at, um, as I said earlier, program design basics. Um, on that program design basics, we're going to ask ourselves a very simple question. What exactly is program design? So, I mean, you hear people say, we're designing a program, we're not designing a program, we're doing this, we're not doing that. What exactly is program design? Now, just um, I, I lighted a few points to for you to pay attention to. It's a process that an organization uses to develop program. Um, that's really it. It, it. Design, as you know, is a, is a common word that is used often. So what is the process that an organization uses to develop a program? Um, it's most often an iterative process um, that involves research. It involves a lot of consultation with stakeholders. It involves what I call an initial design. Well, you can call it an initial design or you can call it a pilot phase. Um, and then it then also involves testing and rollout. Then when it is successful, um, it, it requires a review through an evaluation, a proper evaluation as much as possible. And then, you know, you need to consider scaling it if need be. And I, I keep putting if need be because not every program should be scaled. I know that the next big thing, I mean, the next thing you're thinking about is Oh, let's scale, let's scale, let's take it all around. But not all programs um, um, should be scaled. And I'm just going to speak to that very quickly before I forget, because a program is particularly designed for a, with, with certain factors in mind. So that's why a review is important for scaling, because if you scale, um, even if you're scaling in, in, in quantity or in reach, you need to be conscious that those factors are unchanged if those factors are going to change, then you need to go back to the drawing board before you scale. All right, so um, how do we design programs? You need to research and identify what the needs are. That's, that's the first place to start. Is there a need in the first place? Verify and capture the opportunities. You verify because at first they seem like, you know, these, that these are needs, but you need to double check through a needs assessment or baseline survey or study to be sure that the needs are, are there really. And then how do you capture the opportunities um, that those provide? In addition to that, you find that you, even after you have captured these opportunities, you now need to define your scope. Um, what exactly am I going to do? The, 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 the needs of Nigeria, of any community, their needs are endless. I mean, you, you and that's some, one of the bane of the development sector. You finish one thing, right? And then it seems as if 10 other things crop up. I am wondering, what am I doing? I thought I was going to save the world. Um, you need to be able to define a scope. It's very important. And design a framework that goes with that scope to say, this is how far we will go for now. Um, this is how wide we will go at the moment. And then you know we can look at it again in future. Then think about um, reviewing and engaging again. So after you have designed, you might need to engage your stakeholders one more time to say, this is actually what we want to do. Does it make sense to you? Do you agree? Um, do we have your consent? Do we have your buy-in? Are you interested in partnering with us before you go ahead? And then most importantly, you review. Uh, um, you run a pilot. Uh, most programs don't run pilots because they consider pilots to be expensive. But I often say that why not make your why not make your first your first roll out a pilot so you want to do something for ten thousand people for instance you cascade ten thousand to two thousand per year and maybe you start with 500 in the first year and that serves as a sort of pilot just to be sure that it will work out because you don't want to put in all the resources for five thousand people or two thousand people and then you find out that you run into challenges um, um, or almost immediately or sometime later. This is just a quick tip. Um, and it says immerse, develop, evaluate. So I took all of the processes in the last slide and I put them, I grouped them into three. The first is how do you immerse yourself into the problem to be sure that there is a problem and there's an opportunity? How do you develop um, 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 a solution um, to, to, to be able to add value or solve that problem? Then how do you evaluate what you've done? Those are sort of the three basic steps. Um, and then I, I have taken those steps and actually broken them down into things that are a bit more um, 
prescriptive. But in addition to that, I'll just say, note the two comments on the side, consult with stakeholders, consult with stakeholders. That's because you never can consult enough when it comes to stakeholder engagement. You always have to, all through, all through, you always have to. So these are just actual steps, um, all that I've explained in the last few minutes. Then something else I'd like you to consider is every now and then ask yourself, you know, you hear about this book, maybe I should start recommending now, Simon Sinek, starts with the why. Um, the why is really the essence of a project. Always, always think about it. Ask yourself, go back, identify the essence of the project all over again, because that's what will keep you grounded when things are falling apart. That's what will keep you going when you are discouraged. That's what will remind you of why you started the journey in the first place. Then use tools. There are a lot of tools online um, that you can use and adopt. Even if you don't find ready-made tools, you can create your own tools. I always say that in doing work, um, um, you, you, you can sort of think or envisage a picture in your head and say, this is how I would like to see this information or this is how I'd like to present this information, or this is how I'd like to interpret this information. You can sketch it in, you know, in, in, with a biro or pencil, and then using Microsoft Word, you can use table, smart ads, graph. So always think about tools that you can develop yourself. Don't wait until you find what might be the best tools. Even the best of consultants keep um, coming up with new tools and diagrams as we go along. Um, where the tools will require some expert work, maybe statistical analysis or program design or a particular skill, then you can ask for help or you can, you can identify a tool that is closed and still remodel it for what you want to do. Ensure spread. Another thing to think about in program design. Um, how do you manage the local needs, which will be the needs of the beneficiaries and your partner's vision as a program manager? or program designer? How do you manage that um, to ensure that the value is spread across both sides of the divide? Then four will be leverage. Never forget to leverage. Build relationships, focus on impact, uh, break new grounds. Whatever you want to do, you have to think leverage. You, you don't need to just be winking in the dark. You know, you're somewhere, you're doing something, a lot of people don't know about it. How can you take advantage of resources that are available to you, people that are around you, um, um, and, and everything else that you can use to make sure you can maximize or get the best out of a particular project. Then remember that your best ideas can become irrelevant. Emphasis quickly. No matter how great your idea or your program has been, anything can happen. A rainfall, um, a COVID-19 scare, it might not even be um, that you know, there's COVID-19 or it has gotten to your state, it might just be the, the, the threat, the risk of it. I know um, where the headquarters of uh, the British Leadership Foundation is in Cross River State, they don't, or they claim, or they say, or they believe <laughs> that they do not have a case of COVID-19. I mean, that's difficult to believe. I was reading something of that said that, um, um, what's it called? Kogi State now has a, a, an infection. I don't know how true that is. I need to double check. But this is just to say that no matter how well you have planned, remember that things can change quickly. And I hope that that's the reality that the state government in Cross River is working with now, that your COVID-19 free status can change in a matter of hours or minutes or even seconds. So as a program designer, never forget the fact that your best ideas, the ones you've spent years iterating, engaging, consulting, designing, mapping, scoping, all of the ins that you have spent time doing, it can become irrelevant very quickly. Never forget that. What that teaches you really is that always open your mind up to opportunities. Don't be closed-minded. Always think about, if this happens, what do I do? Okay, this has happened, what next? Um, so always keep that in mind. How do you do a needs assessment? Again, I'm just trying to break down some of the things that I've, I've put there. Um, you, you plan it. What do I want to assess precisely? Um, what, what, where, where is my target? What's the sample size or population? Where am I going to? Who are they? What questions do I want to ask them? What do I want to find out precisely? You collect the, the information from them. You analyze the information. You interpret what the data says. Um, whether it's a yes or no, whether they were, then you document your findings. Documentation is not big ground. Put it in a report, um, summarize it somewhere, 
um, 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 present it in infographics so it's easy to understand and keep it handy so that you can always um, use it to engage um, some of your uh, um, partners or stakeholders in future. Then how do you identify stakeholders? I want to run through a number of these slides. Um, I'll make my slides available um, at a fee in, uh, in, in US dollars only um, for those who are interested. But you identify your stakeholders, you prioritize them, you develop a strategy to engage them, uh, and you actually engage them. <laughs> when you actually engage them, you're putting all of your grammar and all of your planning into action. Um, that's pretty much what um, um, a stakeholder engagement process is about. As I said, um, I'm, these are things I've put into this presentation um, for the benefit of those who might not be very familiar as also reference for those who will get the slides um, after the, the presentation. But I won't dwell so much on them so that we're able to cover all that we have um, to cover today. Then in the case, so a lot of the things I've said in the last few minutes, I've spoken about new programs. So in the case where there's an existing program and you're trying to adopt it or you're trying to tweak it or you're trying to remodel it, what do you do? Or you have a partnership opportunity post COVID-19 because the original program no longer makes sense, it's been disrupted, it's no longer relevant. What do you do? You identify the program when it's brought to you and said, oh, can we partner with you to implement this program? The first question you ask yourself is, are the objectives of this program similar to ours? Are the objectives of this program similar to ours? If it's a yes, you move forward. If it's a no, you say bye-bye. Is the program serving a similar population to ours? So for instance, the Bridge Leadership Foundation works with young people, I believe. That's your primary focus, young people. But by extension, you do work with core stakeholders. So you work with teachers in some cases, policymakers in some cases. But the central point, the, 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 the focus, the target beneficiaries at all times are young people. So if a partnership opportunity comes and they say, oh, we're doing something for um, 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 old people, those who are about to retire, we need to do something to them. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop checking the chats. You can ask about the, the slides a little bit later. Um, um, the TBLF team will make that available. I may not be able to email them to everybody. So is the program serving a similar population to us is a question you want to ask yourself. Um, are there other, you know, contexts? So at, at, so at the surface, it might not be. So for instance, if TBLF got an opportunity to do something for those who are about to retire or in, in an old people's home, um, you can reverse that sort of thinking to say, okay, if this program is targeted at this, how do we get young people to become some sort of social workers or to become responsible for old people? So in trying to find a partnership, you might be able to look at a context to that program context and say, okay, so if the, 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 the program is focused on, on, um, on care for old people, who are those who are caring for them? Can we get young people, train them as social workers so that they support these old people? Again, it's just a way to look at program context, okay? So if yes, you continue, if, if no, then you need to adapt it, to tweak it, as I've just said, to fit what you want to do. Then another question is, do we have similar resources? Do we have resources that are so important? And resources don't have to do with funding. Um, the challenge I have with most nonprofits is the setup, and the first thing they're thinking about is funding. COVID-19 has happened. The biggest fear is what will happen to our funders or what happens to our funding. In this era, right, of post-COVID, nonprofit organizations need to think beyond implementing. They need to be putting much more value on the table. They need to be designing initiatives, solutions, innovation that compel private sector organizations to partner with them. The era of waiting, oh, let me be the one to go and talk to your host community. Let me be the one to go and run this for you. No. Nonprofit organizations in the new era must come to the table with a lot more value. And this value is what will make them um, um, the preferred partner. Okay? So these are just the process towards achieving impact. You think about your resources. What resources do you need for the program? What are the activities that you're going to do? What are the outputs? Again, a lot of people don't understand the difference between outputs and outcomes. And I'm just going to spend one minute to talk about it. Okay? Output is what happens immediately out, um, 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 immediately from your activity. 
So your activity is to conduct a training. Your output is you have trained um, beneficiaries. The outcome is now what the implication of that output is. Okay, so that would be, for instance, increased skill in a particular level, um, confident to be able to maybe approach partners, um, um, they feel more empowered to maybe start businesses. And again, I'm just you know giving them, um, shooting from the hips. Really, don't um, uh, looking for the best example to explain this. But outputs and outcomes are completely different. This is a bit more detail for an M&E session. Okay, and then the impact, of course, is the vision that you see. What happens a bit further mid to long term what is consistent is a consistent outcome over a period of time and what that means um in in the same context so in summary all that i've been saying is when your program design is effective because it all starts from design your implementation is going to be effective you are going to be able to provide a context for better partnerships in an era like this and most especially um, you would have positive results at the end of the day. Your design is effective, your implementation follows suit. It provides you a context for better partnerships and helps you to reach your goals or achieve your aims at the end of the day. Um, I was talking about this earlier and I thought to add this, I'm not going to dwell on it, is to say, how do you scale a program? You know, I said earlier that you just don't scale because it is nice to it sound, you know. So I, I see a lot of nonprofits who do things like what the biggest we're the largest, um, we have consistently scaled from this to this. It's not about the numbers. It's not about that you started with five and you're now at 32,000, no. It's about the quality, never about the quantity, always about the quality, which is why I started with, at the beginning of the first slide, what I was saying was, if need be, never think scale unless there's a reason for scale, unless there's a potential impact, unless there are clear cut rules for you to achieve that. Don't scale for scaling sake because you, when you scale, sometimes you lose, you lose the quality, the impact is reduced, it no longer makes much sense, it loses value, um, and then you are not even able to capture whether you are scaling well um, and whether having scaled the program, you are, you know, making, achieving the same impact and uh, an effect on your, on your target. So, just you know, something to think about. Because of time, I'll run. Um, another thing I'd like to quickly highlight is every time nonprofits focus so much about monitoring and evaluation, it's almost like a box ticking exercise. So you do a program in next thing, oh, come on, let's evaluate, m and &E. the m and &E result said yes. But most of the time, we do not look at quality control. And I think that a lot of nonprofits and even programs in general have to move away a bit from m and &E to quality control. You would never get a positive m and &E result or report if you haven't taken care of a lot of things from the quality control level, okay? So quality control, program standards, you know, how decisions are taken, governance, a lot of things must, you know, you know, be paid attention to, you must pay attention to them at the implementation phase, ensuring quality control all through, um, 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 especially if your monitoring and evaluation um, elements are independent. You're working with a partner and another partner is going to monitor, another partner is going to evaluate. Don't set yourself up. Ensure that you know you, you are thinking quality control all through. And don't just also wait. Engage your monitoring partner uh, or your monitoring and evaluation partner during the course of the program to get useful, to get useful insight um, and information about what is going on so that you can make certain corrections along the way where possible. Again, this is a bit all that I have said, now broken down in proper steps. How did we get here? Very quickly, we're discussing all of this because something has happened. And it happened because we are now living in a new reality. And the new reality is that the world that we live in is volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. It's a business terminology that is called VUCA. When we say you're living in a VUCA world, we are saying that the, the situation is complex, which means there are many interconnected parts and variables. Some of the information is not available, some is a, some, some information available, some cannot be predicted, some can be predicted. It's volatile, which means it can change, you know, it can be, 
one tomorrow, ten thousand. Okay, it's volatile. It has the the quality or the capacity to you know um, um to escalate beyond control. It's ambiguous. It's not clear. Okay, you're not sure if we're dealing with a health issue or we're dealing with a governance issue. We're not sure if we're, our program is a breakdown of the health system or lack of leadership or corruption. It's ambiguous. It has different parts. It's uncertain. Right? There isn't any order. We know that things have changed, but we don't even know if they're going to change further. These are some of the things that are happening in our world now. And at a time like this, an organization is thinking how, or you as a nonprofit, you're thinking, how can I, as a partner, how can I engage effectively? How can I do my work in an uncertain reason? Because what do I need to do? So the more non-profit organizations think this way, the better they'll be able to come to terms with what, what they're supposed to do. In a complex situation, people are looking for things that are specific, right? When, when a situation is ambiguous, people want clear understanding. Now, as a partner, as a non-profit or a startup or whatever you are, even a business, do you, do you understand what is going on? Because if you do not understand what is going on, if you don't know the relationship between all of these factors, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, you can't, you can't, you can't process. And I've seen a lot of that, you know, online, a lot of online sessions, a lot of um, um, uh, Instagram live sessions, a lot of knowledge just being bandied around with, you know, little wisdom in terms of what exactly is going on. What does that mean for the development ecosystem that we have in Nigeria? What are nonprofits going to do, especially those that were not sustainable or that are not even sustainable by virtue of their, their structure? You cannot at this time be depending on grants and be thinking, hey, what happened to all our grants? Oh, hey, what no, you can't. If you're still thinking that way, then you're going to run into a lot of trouble because in the next few months and years, the, the last thing organizations want to think about is just giving money to people. There's going to be a higher demand for value, for instance, okay? So that brings us to the end of the first module. And the second module is really about decision making. And I had said that the reason I, this module made it into this presentation in the first place is because um, it occurred to me that you cannot effectively engage and rethink your program design without putting yourself, a bit of empathy, putting yourself where your stakeholders are. And that's why I said decision making consideration because if you do not think about these things, then it will be difficult for you to make them where they are. So now is some time for activity. You've been listening to me for about 15 minutes or thereabout. I'd like us to do some activity. So can you quickly in the chat box just list what are the, what are the qualities that make an organization a preferred project partner? So at this time, an organization or the government or anybody they're looking for partners to do some work what are the qualities can anybody um i think when we get the first five to ten we can go we're about 25 on this call so what are the qualities that make an organization a preferred project partner who wants to help us just type it in and i'll read them as we go along and why do you think these qualities are important if you can put all if not then i can take some of these qualities um, and we can go with them. So what are the qualities that make an organization a preferred project partner? I just uh, mentioned some of them when I was talking about the VUCA world. Anybody? Aha! This room is quiet. Okay, Pat Ben says a reliable organization. I agree. Um, and I guess that was from the slide where I spoke about, um, you know, what, what organizations are looking for in a volatile situation. They're looking for um, people who are reliable, um, who will not change. Today you say, yes, we'll do it tomorrow. You say, ah, no, we can't do it again. No. There's something going on. We can't do it again. Commitment, transparency, integrity. Okay, very good. Um, transparency and quality delivery. Good. That's from Abiodun. Um, legitimacy and credibility. Track record. Very true. Structure. Structure is something that we don't often sometimes um, um, consider to be very important. Structure is it's so important. A lot of funders will not give 
any amount of money to an organization that doesn't have some sort of governance or structure all right not me my sister and my cousin are running this ngo okay i've seen vision alignment i agree um how does your vision align with that of your partner and what you're trying to do um value worth very important value <laughs> so these days uh, non-profits are going to you know sort of have to prove their value worth 10 20 times over <laughs> to be able to get partnerships in some cases i've seen sustainability of the idea very true especially with changing times you know it's important that you know what exactly is is um what exactly am i giving bringing to the table and i've just put here three things i've identified as what i call a design approach to um to program design or strategy you know how so in thinking the first thing is the theory of change usually a theory of change is um your explanation your narrative about what you're trying to do um and and again this is um this is a, a different training on its own i can't go into it about you know, what the TOC is, is and stands for and why it's important. But two questions I want you to bear in mind. First is what do you want to achieve? The second is what is your route to success? What do you want to achieve? What is your route to success? That's under the theory of change. On that impact, how do you want the beneficiary to feel? Um, and I'm using feelings here because really <laughs> in this era, those are very important. Mental health, how people feel, what resonates with them, what they remember. Okay. What do you want them to remember that happened? Okay. When the project was implemented, for instance, value, what are you bringing to the table and why should you be the preferred partner? So that's sort of the way to approach when you're designing the program, you think about these three things because these are the, almost the first three questions that um, your partner is going to ask, or even if they don't ask you is what they'll be thinking in their minds. All right. Then we go into decision making um, and considerations. In any moment of decision, the best you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing, and the worst thing you can do is nothing. Okay? The best you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing, and the worst thing you can do is nothing. That was by Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt. Um, so, what we're trying to say here is don't because of fear, not make a decision at all. That's the worst that can ever happen. That all through this, in your organization, you've not said anything. You have just been looking. You have just been looking and observing. You've not said anything. You've not reached out to any partner, any stakeholder. You've not issued any statement. You've not done anything. You, you, you've just frozen. That's the worst thing that an organization can do at a time like this. But when you are approaching your partners and your stakeholders, you need to think about them as people who make decisions based on six different types of emotions. And they are called six thinking hearts. And that's why we put this. So that when you get certain reactions, you are not surprised. People process, people make decisions based on six different sentiments or, or temperaments. And this is an adaptation from Edward De Bono's um, leadership styles. Okay? I'm just going to run through them quickly. Um, they, these are... The different colors i'll start with the first the creativity hat which is the green hat you'll find that those who are very creative are the ones that will be you know, really excited about your new ideas when you send it this way they'll say really okay good ah, that's fantastic bring it on bring it on even though they don't have any plans to fund it they, they themselves have not taken any decision yet but they're just happy that you know you're already thinking about alternatives and possibilities so if you are relating with a member of an organization that has this sort of persona or things in this way you would think that he's the best person since sliced bread but don't forget that another partner may not react like this to you. that partner might be judgmental to say you, you guys are just so selfish i mean in all that is happening you're already thinking about pro program which program and to see what is going on. People are dying. <laughs> oh, God, please just wait. Let's even get our bearing and know what we're doing before you start bringing any program idea, how you want to pivot or what you are doing. No, 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 please, please, please. We're not even going to think about it yet. It's too early. You reach out to them after they say, no, 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 it's still too early to look at anything. That's how they think. That's how they make decisions. They are people who are big on caution. They are pessimistic. The, the first thing they think about is risk and danger and negative and negative. And before we 
make them look like the devils. These, these sentiments are also very good um, at another level in making decisions. But you need to think caution. You need to think, what if this fails? What if this doesn't work? That's where you need these kinds of people. But you cannot discard their energy now at a time like this. Another set of persons you might meet, your stakeholders, will be big picture people. You know, they're managing, they're organizing, you know, they're trying to ex explain what's the process, what are we going to do, so what happens next in the community, they're they are saying, okay, if you are, if you are going to lose your, if you have lost your job completely, uh, write your name here, um, if you are not sure you're going to lose your job, stand here, um, if your job is still okay, at least you can still manage, stand here, they're the ones that are sort of thinking about process, so what are we going to do, so how, so, so what do we do next, um, so, so how do we go from here? That's how they think. They facilitate, they make things happen. They organize, naturally comes to them. You would have a partner like this who will be the one that will reach out to you first to send you an email. So what are you thinking? How are your staff members? Are they okay? Have you guys closed your office? Okay, so what about our project sites in the community? Have you reached out to them? What are they saying? How are they feeling? Okay, in the meantime, when we suspend the program, we don't have money. Can we get our partners to give some palliatives? Can we go and give them something? That's how we process a blue heart thinking person might be thinking then those who are you know positive judgment critical thinker hope benefits you know it's okay i mean covid19 can only just stop us for a few months we'll go back to the drawing board we'll, we'll you know we'll go and look at it again and see how we're going to get this project off the ground i'm quite optimistic that worst case scenario covid19 will set us back for about six months to one year but you know if we get our acts together we'll do the right thing that's how those people are other people are by information please What's the likelihood of this thing going in Nigeria? What's the death count as today? No, you need to be sending emails to your partners every week to tell them what the new NCDC figures are. That's who they are, their objective. <laughs> they are thinking, what are the facts? Data analysis, what's going on? That If you come and tell them, I want to do the deal, ask, have you done a needs assessment? I mean, have you gone to the community, for instance? Or have you reached, have you called your stakeholders to find out that they are okay with this? How many of them were really okay with this? Those are those kinds of people. I don't have an answer for And that. then you have another group of people who are all about passion, feelings, emotion, you know. These are the people that empathize the most. They're the ones that say, oh, I can imagine how you feel right now. Um, they put themselves in your shoes. Again, these are just the ways... So if you, if you, in your organization, you'll find out that you may have met all of these six kinds of people over the, or in the course of your career or your work, you may have met all the six kinds of people. Don't look at any of them as bad or good, but always just think about the fact that that's how they are wired. And you need to know who they are and know how to approach conversations with them and know how to manage them in terms of your program and your project and know how to present information to them. And of course, know how to convince and persuade them um, 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 to consider what you're trying to achieve. So, so that's very important because we're in an era where there are a lot of emotions, a lot of confusion, mental health issues are, you know, more, more um, emphasized. It's important that you are also thinking about people and their temperaments and not just approaching. Because if you are forcing a, a, a critic to see the big picture, you're going to irritate him in a short time. So he's a guy, um, aren't you, you're not, you're not, you're, obviously we're exchanging emails or we're speaking on home, but we're not listening to each other, you know. So you can't go with optimism and think that optimism is going to convince a critic. No, you go with the criticisms with him. You go with your caution. You go with your risks. Um, we have looked at the project. These are our risks and these are how we, you know, intend to manage them. Once you say risk, he wants to listen. He wants to hear you, and then you are better able to talk to him. The last module that we're going to look at very soon before I wrap up is the new reality. What is our new reality all over the world and at this time um, in an era of COVID-19? What is our new reality? After a pandemic, what happens? Whoa, a lot. Economic impacts, recession, job losses, pay cuts, bankruptcy social impact, exclusion, people don't want to go to certain places anymore, isolation, uh, contagious disease conditions. Now, if you sneeze in public, you are on your own. The speed with which people will move away from you will be worried. It's going to be worse than uh, those who, you know, I think the other um, um, condition is tuberculosis. When you, 
you know, woofing cough when he cough and cough and cough. People say, ah, maybe he has TB. This one, nobody's going to say maybe. Once you start coughing or sneezing, people are just going to, in fact, that's if they even <laughs> come very close to you in the first place. Environmental hazards, climate change, um, bushfires, a lot of things are going to happen or not happen because of movement, because of staying at home, because of restrictions in you know, human activities, social cultural or socioeconomic activities. Governance challenges, you would have protests as you are having already all over the world. People are coming out to tell their government, reopen the economy, we want to go back to work. We're tired of staying at home. You know, coups, the elections that are coming up, assassination attempts, mass, mass sacks and all of that. So these are the things that happen after an, after a pandemic. And these are the things you need to think about. Then at the individual level, people are grappling with what I call risky, condition, uh, risky decisions. Should I go and do a test or not? I started feeling funny yesterday. Should I go and do a test or not? Should I suspend an impactful program? Should I postpone it? Should I redesign it completely? Because of course, partnerships and other elements. You know, I may lose my job. So instead of losing my job completely, should I just agree to this offer to take half of my salary for the next six months? Or should I just take my full salary for this month and go take my destiny into my hand. So at the, at the ma macroeconomic level, or the, you know, nationwide or countrywide or regionwide or the public level, people are dealing with things. And individually, people are also dealing with a lot of risky decisions at the time. So to redesign your program, you have to think about it. Where are your stakeholders? At the beginning, you know, the first three weeks to one month, people, and again, these things, please, these phases overlap one another. So don't think, oh, phase one must finish before you go into phase two. No, the phases overlap one another, okay? So phase one might be happening. Some people would have moved to phase three. Some people are still in phase one. So think about it, okay? And it's just to help you analyze and understand what is going on. So that you can make the right decision remember this session is about rethinking program strategy and program design to how do you think how do you approach your program um how do you do things in a way that helps you to get the best value and the best advantage so in the first phase of a triage and information people are disoriented suddenly there's a lockdown you can't go anywhere people are working from home no school children a bit of confusion your partners and your audience and your stakeholders. So, so this, this was designed for audience. It's really a communication um, strategy or prism. But I decided to use it because it's, it's the same, in my opinion. It's pretty relevant. So whether they're your audience or, they are or your stakeholders or your target beneficiaries, we're still talking about people. So your partners or your stakeholders are disoriented at the time. After they move to worry, loss and pain the situation is now properly setting in they're now thinking solutions what can they do what can they do to feel better what are the next steps then they move to a bit of optimism they're restless you know they're trying to so they move from disorientation to being worried to being restless they're thinking you know this boredom is really low ah, is this how i'm going to be bored so if i don't get my job back is this how i would have stayed at home for the past six months what on earth is going on People are eager. They want to get out. <laughs> That's why they are protesting in some countries. They want to go back to work. Even if they don't have jobs, they want things to go back to it. They want to have a sense of control. They want to come back to a bit of normalcy. This is how my life used to be before suddenly everything, you know, you know, stopped, so to speak. Okay? And then the last phase is recovery and, and rebound. Your, your target beneficiaries your stakeholders are rebuilding they're coming back to life they're trying to reestablish old routines they're making more conscious decisions they're thinking okay so yeah so now that we're back this is what we're going to do so at every phase you must consider what is going on and this is just a chart i found i thought to look at it and, and it says between february and march people were in the information now stage you know so that stage is really what on earth is going they're trying to grapple with what is happening what is happening now 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 okay what what can i do um should i make masks should i change my business model should i think how far what's going on and gradually as you can see the chart about may because this is a recently released report you can see that people are now thinking okay future optimism if you can't do physical events can we do them online 
I had a conversation with a client yesterday. He was talking to me about publishing his book, and he was saying, "Does it even make sense to do a book presentation online?" I said, "Well, that's what all of you, our clients, need to you know consider. We will convince you, but." So those are the things that people are thinking about. Oh, summer is gone. Forget summer for 2020. It's pretty much cancelled. Okay. So what are the options? If I'm going to do my wedding, what does that mean? I've been planning this wedding. Eh? I've even sold that should it be. What am I going to do? Okay. So those are some of the things to think about when you are thinking about your stakeholders. Ask yourself, where are my my clients, my funders, my partners my stakeholders where are they and this example says if your consumers and that's because of it's a it's a it's a borrowed document if your consumers are here you should be ahead of them so that's why this session is very important because by now you should already have your strategy post covid 19. so if people and i know people have moved away from empathy and relevance they're now in optimism or some people are still stuck here but wherever your stakeholders wherever your partners are you're supposed to be ahead of them. You should be here planning creatively it's for 16 them. Hours. Because if you are not ahead of them, planning for them, you can't, you can't be in the same boat as they are in to get the best value. You're going to be considered as an afterthought. Your program is going to come behind. You have to lead. You have to be ahead. If you're not ahead, then you can't make the best out of the situation. So what should be your strategy? Again, Clearly communicate. Um, make sure that you're thinking context. Offer a vision for the future. I said, what are the things that you can do? Address how long term, you know, your program is going to be relevant in the long term. That's if your program is relevant. If your program is not relevant. You need to start thinking how your program can be relevant long term. Okay. Now, I said applying this to a program strategy. When you're in the middle of a project that things are going on, you are grappling with two things. And I want you to pay a bit of attention to this. You are grappling with information reliability and information stability. Two different things. Reliability is, it is, can I, is it reliable if it's somebody's opinion? If it's a fact, it's more reliable. I hope we can all agree with that. That if it's a fact, it's more reliable than, it, than if it's someone's opinion. But stability, is it fluid or is it fixed? If it's fluid, means it can change. If it's fixed, means it might not change. Again, might not, because nothing is really set in stone. So when you are in the middle of a program and COVID-19 happens, and you're dealing with information that is opinion-based and it's fluid, opinion-based is that your partners are getting afraid and they think, note, they think that COVID-19 might disrupt your program altogether. They think. But you don't have any fact from a health professional yet to be sure that these are the direct impacts. You are dealing with, you know, just some postulation, some ideas that may be fueled by, you know, uh, anxiety or denial or whatever. You need to decide on how to move your program immediately. What do you do to advance the program and move it forward as soon as possible? What do you do? Okay. And like I said, this is um, really a strategy that is used in making decisions. This is a strategy that is used in making decisions. So I just borrowed it for this, um, um, for this presentation because it helps you to put into context what I'm trying to say. Now, if you are dealing with, again, you're in the middle of a program, COVID-19 happens. You know, I said, do something to move the program forward. Now you have a bit more information that you can rely on that is fact-based. And you can say that information is a bit more stable now, you know, in terms of the, the health, social distancing, the lifestyle practices that can help you stay away from COVID-19. You need to now make better decisions, key decisions on the project. So, for instance, if you're in the middle of a program, COVID-19, in pulling the program forward, you might need to suspend some elements or put it on hold for the moment. But when you have a bit more reliable and stable information, then you take the final decision. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay? Now, if you are dealing with facts, so it is the information is reliable, 
But even the health professionals themselves tell you that this thing can change you. Yes, for, from what we hear now, COVID-19 shows the following symptoms. Three weeks after, they say, oh, there's something called an asymptomatic strain, which means you might not sneeze, you might not show any symptoms whatsoever, but you are positive or you can test positive for COVID-19. Aha! That's new information. You were banking on the fact that anybody who is hot in your program, you pull them out and tell them, Uncle, please, can you go home until we're sure you don't have COVID-19. But now you come upon new information that says, I can be normal, I'm not, I'm not warm, I'm not hot, I'm not sneezing, nothing, I don't feel any tightness in my chest, but it's possible that I can be COVID-19 positive. Okay, new information, what do I do? You decide on your boundaries. So we're going to make sure that we test everybody or everybody who is going to be a part of the program going forward would have to run a test. So think about organizations like CACOVID, the coalition, where they had to do, they still had to do some meetings, they had to go into the field. I believe every member of that committee steering group had to undergo a COVID-19 test. I mean, just to be sure, you have to decide on the boundaries. If you're going to keep working in this group that is trying to you know, provide emergency response, you know, provide relief materials and really drive this project. We need to be sure that among this small group, we're not infecting ourselves. So whether you are symptomatic or you are asymptomatic, please, you need to come in for a test. Let's be sure. So we know what we're doing. Okay. You use this to eliminate op options and program plans that may change upon new information. Then the last is you are dealing with information that is opinion based, but it's fixed then you know, okay, we need to really decide what exactly are we doing? Can we do a bit more research on this? Let's be sure. What are the experts saying? Let's make sure that we're dealing with facts and we're not just, you know, um, um, dealing with information that is, that is, you know, there's, I call them WhatsApp nation. These people that send all kinds of very interesting news and development via WhatsApp. So these are the different decisions or the different approaches and the different actions that you can take right smack in the middle of a program that has been disrupted now how do you rethink your program strategy repurposing with purpose you need to react acknowledge the impending or current threats take steps to suspend aspects of program this is some summarizing all that i've said communicate urgently to stakeholders demonstrate leadership and courage and you move here from reacting to responding which is empathy, reflection, and you are at a crossroad. You provide updates on the program status. You engage stakeholders with clarity. You offer support, response efforts, stopgap measures, managing new information and updates, demonstrating empathy to all, revisiting your project risk management. So all those things I say in program strategy, what are your risk management plan, continuity plan? It always sounds nice <laughs> until now. I know so many people who said to me, I know we had a business continuity plan somewhere. I never really looked at it. But they had to go and dig all those documents out and all those policies now because I'm in this period because of COVID-19. Then for your future now phase, which is from now going forward as economies plan to reopen in the beginning of June, which is just a few days from now, you need to lead with optimism and energy, right? review and redesign what are the options for the program in line with new realities you should have already sent a scenario plan to your partner all the projects we're working on we sent them two scenario plans completely virtual or digital hybrid option because we prepare a scenario plan and we've sent it in for weeks now okay you review the options you develop a, develop a scenario plan engage stakeholders with those options to get, secure buy-in Keep brainstorming on new opportunities because things are still changing. As you happen on new information, how does it affect my program? How can I adjust? How can I adjust? What, do what I call drop, suspend, or cut off. Drop some things. When I mean drop, it's just as they are. Just let them be. Just don't do anything about them. Suspend means this one cannot happen until in two years' time when everything comes to normal. Cut off, just, it's not even a part of our plan anymore. We're not even thinking about it. Schedule possible new timelines. Stay expectant and stay ready. All right? And then what you do after that is you prepare your rollout. Map your output outcomes, identify key learnings, 
identity learning is so important because you need to archive things in an institutional memory. So when they say knowledge management, it always sounds like all this high falutin. This is everything that happens in an era like this is useful for knowledge management. You need to archive an operational guideline for future occurrences. If something happens like this in future, what do we do? How do we map and document all the things that we're doing, all things that are changing, all things that is happening, so that in future someone can come and refer to it within the organization or within a community or, or body of practice? All right. So how does this play out? You find out that your implementation model may be changed. You have to pay attention to better risk management, virtual or digitization routes, new partnerships, because your old partners may not be relevant anymore. In your resource planning, you optimize new resources, leverage opportunities to scale. You must audit your project. Audit, where are we? What have we lost? What can we save? What did we gain? Where can we save money? Then your learning outcomes. What new skills do my colleagues and I need to learn? What are the gaps? COVID-19 has shown us that this is a program plan that we thought made a lot of sense. It actually has some gaps. What are those gaps? And then is there an opportunity to do a hybrid model? A bit of what we're doing before and a bit of what we should be doing now. Okay? So we'll take our exercise to wrap up. Choose an answer and in one minute explain why. Do you think your current program plans and decisions um, um, on COVID-19 are sufficient? Do you think your current program plans and decisions on projects around COVID-19 are sufficient? So yes, no, somewhat far from ideal. Please use the chat box to respond. Yes, no, somewhat far from ideal. Please be honest. We're all learning together. And then I would like to hear one or two persons speak and tell us why. Why? They think so. Um, so as I wait for your responses, another one. There's an adage that says, never let a crisis go to waste. Never let a crisis go to waste. Um, and That's the, the, the tip. It's a popular adage. Never let a crisis go to waste. And I want to ask all of you, if the statement above is correct, how have you managed a program during this period? Or maybe not this period, maybe another crisis you had in the past. How did you manage your programs? What did you do about your strategy, rethinking, you know, and all of that? How did you manage it? What do you plan to do better or differently? So I'm glad we've done uh, a, a, a two quick exercises and then I can take those with your questions um, and we'll call it a day. Um, looking at my time, I think I did about uh, I did about 50, 55 minutes there about from when I started. Okay, so I can take questions. I think I'll uh, I, I, I hand this back to Ndifreke so he can um, moderate the questions. Okay. So I've okay. seen some responses far from my deal somewhat. Yeah. So back to Indy. Yeah, Emilia, thank you so, so very much. Uh so much, so much content, so much value you have dropped in the last fifty to five minutes. And uh, I hope they believed you when you said there's so much that you can't actually cover because I mean, I'm just seeing you drop things and I'm like, I hope they understand. I hope they understand. I hope they understand. I mean, I mean we've talked about, you know, the, the six different thinking hats, you know, uh, talking about dealing with our stakeholders, our benefactors, our funders, our sponsors or targets, you know, as the case may be. We've talked about, you know, uh, how we need to begin to apply these strategies, you know, to the situations that we currently face. And I, I don't want it to look like what she's saying is, is far-fetched. And that's why the, the, next, the next session is very, very important. If you can relate to these things, you know, uh, that's the essence of these two questions that she just mentioned now. I need, we need to see your comments in the chat box so that we can just maybe select one or two of you to, to share your experience, okay? If you can relate to the fact that, I mean, uh, your current uh, program design, your current plans, 
your current strategy is still valid you know even during this covid 19 pandemic as in you don't need to do anything about it no as in it's rock solid eh? <laughs> the kind that <laughs> the kind that they say is a is odeshi you know the nothing they catch up <laughs> if but, you think that is there, it fine there are, there are organizations that this is a win for this is such a and that that is that's the important of your second question you right you, you get me that's how you, that's how i said those two questions are very key never allow a cri- i'm one person that believes in that never allow in a crisis to go to waste because take it or leave it again it, it, it comes from the mindset perspective you know how you how you reason things how you think things how you see things and you know how you identify opportunities and cap- capitalize on them you know so uh, i think we we'll open the floor but just before we go to those two questions i just want you to speak to two things uh, a bit uh emilia if you can just right. do maybe if you can do that in the three to five minutes you know the the, the subject of pivoting you get me the subject of pivoting is very key through a little light what are those things uh, i know you mentioned something like on it in passing but for an organization that is looking towards pivoting what are you know like three indicators you will say okay look out for this things you know if at all you must pivot because i know you made mention of the fact that you know mm-hmm. people that want to scale up uh, you know sometimes they don't even take do an assessment if they really really need to scale up or if they should just, they should just drop the idea totally they just believe ah okay everybody's scaling up let me scale up and then at the end of the day you are scaling up or you are scaling up out of your goals out of your objectives you're just doing nothing you're just being busy you know can you just speak to uh, speak to the issue of pivoting what factors should we look at for and out of all these factors what would you recommend as as a professional in the industry and then the second thing uh for those of us dealing with uh, many of these hearts this thinking heart man <laughs> it's it's tough. <laughs> seriously <laughs> it's really I really to tough. Add, i forgot to <laughs> add that it's possible for one person to to uh, wear the different hats at different uh, times exactly we that is actually where i'm coming <laughs> to you get me so you you have us you have a stakeholder a sponsor a partner is a green hat at the same time is a black hat at the same time is a blue hat i mean <laughs> so how do you what kind of soundproof strategy or plan do you need to come up with to be able to engage if you can just speak to these two things in the next five minutes while we get we allow the participant um, come up with their um, questions yeah. um okay so two things the first you asked was about five of yes and what do you do in a time like this so i think the the, the market the market and the demand should should um should be the first thing that you think about um okay. if in an era of a pandemic you find out that there's no market for your existing business you are a luxury textile manufacturer or you um make clothes and mm. people are at home <laughs> and they are at home they are not wearing luxury clothes to go out to functions they are at home and they are wearing probably you know pullovers and things like that then you know that your market is is hit and it's been hit bad and you find that some people have done that successfully um and started producing face masks um as soon as yeah. um i i'm trying to remember one european country said look this is the sort of progress we have in you know, mentioned changing information new information that we've recorded through the use of face masks it made a lot of sense you find global brands across the world um those who make um perfumes for instance are making hand sanitizers yeah um I, i'm trying to think of some other examples so you you have global brands manufacturing those who manufacture cars and are, are trying to make ventilators and you know, are making other you know types of equipment and stuff like that so your market is first the market is what think about do i have a market if i don't where's the market what does the market need that's one two would be what resources do i have do to I meet have, the market yeah. needs because it's possible for you to want to make meet a market need for instance i might want to produce face masks because what i learned how to sew when i was in secondary school for instance but if i don't have sewing machines how do i even meet that market demand 
I have to yeah. find a tailor who has machines or I have to go and buy machines and, and that the turnaround time for that and the costs that involved might be a challenge for me. So how do I adapt, you know, based on the resources that I have to be able to meet the market needs? I think those would be the two uh, most important things to think about before you say you want to pivot your business. Then to answer your second question, um, the different thinking has provide you with the sort of responses that you should expect so that nothing, you know, takes you by surprise. surprise. You, are yeah. not, you are not embarrassed, you are not confused. Um, ideally, your strategy um, or your program or your program strategy, in, in when you are rethinking it or redesigning it, it should, it should be a 360. Um, 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 approach that takes into consideration the six hats. What will make the red hat person, you know, be so passionate? So oh, great, great. I like this. It, it's people focused. What will make the critic say, "Oh, we've already thought about what can go wrong, and this is what we're going to do about what can go wrong." What will make the process person say, "Oh, because of all of the challenges involved, we're going to start with this and move to this and move to that and move to that." What will make the optimistic person say? You know, we're very confident that if we get our, if we get our, heart, our act together, we're going to succeed at this. We'll make the information mm -hmm. analyst, the you know, the white hat person say, these are the facts. According to the data, this is what we're going to do. So it helps you to think about your program from a 360 approach, and it also mm -hmm. helps you, you know, to prepare. So you're not, I mean, no matter what you get from your stakeholder, your partner, or your client, you're not, um, you're not surprised. You're not going back to the drawing board to see. Um, we'll think a bit more about that and we'll get back to you. Mm. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and just as you were talking, just one last uh, yeah, question sure. came to my mind. And this time around with, with, a, with a scenario in mind. Okay. So uh, 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 just about some weeks before the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, uh, entered full scale. All right. So we'll... We're engaged with a, a certain partner uh, okay. who, who was looking for people to actually implement a particular problem and program for them. And of course, the target audience were, were children and okay. teachers. And you know, I mean, a huge, a huge uh, target audience of our, of our young people yeah. are focused in that direction. And before the COVID-19, the whole, the whole system was, you know, designed in such a way that we're going to have a physical meet with these people, okay? So, and all of that and all of that. And so suddenly now we are having that back and forth engagement with this partner. And I recently had to to, you know, respond to a survey that was sent to me and they were like, okay, uh, what are the chances of doing, I mean, you mentioned it in your presentation, so I'm just trying to put uh, some face to what you're saying. You know, what are the chances of us still doing this pro program, you know, physically? Have we, and then they're also asking, have we thought of taking this better? How can we implement it? Then a key question came in. If we're taking it virtual, by what percentage is your target audience going to drop? Now, you know, when I agree to the fact that the target audience is going to drop, if at all you're able to, you know, uh, implement it strictly virtual, you know, a lot of things come in. We need to begin to look at how can we do, you know, what's the structure we're going to build to ensure that we do it strictly virtual. And then our target audience are children that are supposed to be in secondary school schools, do they even have access to the virtual, you know, get across to them within the timeline that this, uh, our, our partners want and all of that. In, 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 as somebody can help me be one of you that I also face with that, it will not be the same. Okay. In, <laughs> I mean, how do you, how do you approach is, that, you know? So the first is, um, <laughs> the plan and then COVID happened. Okay. Now, when COVID happened, what did you do? Did you um, mm. take a quick okay. assessment of, this, of the possible risks to your program? Um, I would have loved that you yeah. didn't wait for your partner to ask you those questions, that you would have, um, you would have mm. uh, already have checked with, on your beneficiaries and you would have been sharing a plan to them um, in light 
or in, you know with the new reality that uh, that we are faced with um this is what we plan to do so again like i said with okay. one of our clients scenario a b c scenario one we scale down a bit and we target you know young people who have yeah. access to a b c d e which means you um categorize them according to socioeconomic classes option b we suspend what we wanted to do but we work on this Plan new effect. model which helps us to meet the objectives that we wanted to meet before we're doing the four. Mm. Um, option C, we do um, the same thing that we're going to do, but we use virtual um, means. So the first is you scale down and you focus, or you do something okay. new, or you do the same thing again, modified for the, so, so these are things that you put forward to them. And in that okay. same document, you see what are the implementations for, well, what are the, um, um, what does that mean for, or what does that mean for our budget? What does that mean for the resources that we need? What does that mean for the timeline? Interestingly, the project I spoke about yeah. is also one that has to do with young people that we need. Um, and the school system. Okay. And it was the same thing. And some of the things okay. we encountered, I mean, without mentioning the client or the person or the project was again, reaching out to the young people. Do they have access to data? And we even considered as much as yeah. the funder, the partner, providing access to data but you, again wow. was how do you map how do you no, track map all of that, all of that. yeah and yeah. then we spoke to and not because it's a multi-stakeholder part partnership project and he said look as much as we've done this all over the world to be honest we've never done it virtually so as much mm. as we love what you're doing you're thinking ahead doing? but we're not ready yeah. <laughs> we can't we can't so look at it virtually content immediately because we've never done it before. So give us some time and we'll get back to you. So what we did was we designed the stop gap and said, pending when these people get back, can we leverage the internet? Can mm -hmm. we leverage social media to do this? Which will achieve a fair bit of engagement um, and also buy our other partners time to come on board with our scenario plans. So to be honest, when we talk about re rethinking program strategy, don't think that it's all positives, that you can tweak every strategy to fit a situation. No. Yeah. I'm yeah. supposed to use this opportunity to say that there are just certain strategies that will not work in a mm. COVID-19 era or post-COVID-19 era. So era. When, the more you think about it and try to go around it, it just won't work. And the sooner you admit that it just won't work, Accept. Yeah, yeah. So we need to accept. We need to accept. Save your time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emilia. Okay. So uh, we're, we're going to open it up to participants, uh, other participants. If you have your questions, uh, you can just signify with a raise of hands, and we probably may give you uh, opportunity to speak uh, into the meeting, or you just want to drop your questions via chat. I'm surprised I've not seen any questions up till now. Is it that all 19 of us that are still in this call, uh, is it that we, are, we all understand and agree and uh, feel everything is okay, fine, and nothing needs to be done? Do we so, call them out? Please. I can see some people here. I can see from Lola's <laughs> iPhone. Uh, <laughs> I can see Martha. Uh -huh. I can see Opem Oden. Yeah. Um, I can see Cherish, Faith, Abiodu, yeah. Arije, I think. Yeah. John, Favor, Josephine, Faith, and someone, Andrew, Ebosele. Interesting, Andrew, I've seen a long time. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, there's, there's Josephine friends. and Emma. Uh, so, guys, just drop your questions if you have. Uh, if there are no questions, I uh, will just kindly require that you quickly fill an evaluation form. And yes, so as not to waste our time for that, let me just summarize. So in the last hour, we've okay. looked at um, a program design, yeah. basics of program design, looked at an overview, steps to planning, steps to scale, we looked at what it means to be in a VUCA world, then we looked at decision making. How do we approach decision making? Um, how do we approach the design question? Um, and then what are the different thinking hats? So 
just trying to understand the different ways that our partners and beneficiaries and targets receive information, how they make decisions, really. Yeah. Um, and then the next is our new reality, looking through the different stages of crisis, trying to find out where our stakeholders are, um, to understand what stages they are, so we know how to meet them at a particular stage, and then how it plays out in, you know, it's one thing to see all these things, but how does it really play out when you're managing a project? And then the next steps I would just like to end with this would be, um, I will share my slide, and there the, are reference documents, there's a slide on references, where you can get some resources um, that were used in in developing this uh, uh, training material. Um, I would also recommend some books that you're going to read um, if you're interested. I, I, I'd, I'd given one was um, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's another one by Josephine Nogra I can't remember what she's called. She's the founder of Acumen. She has a new book. Um, I, and I think that it's a great book that you should read it. Okay. Efosa Jomo and Clayton, Clayton Christensen have a book that's called The Prosperity Paradox, how to um, create market creating innovations and how to think about new markets and non-consumption. I think it's a great book that you should read as well. Um, there's uh, Digital, The New Code of Wealth by J.J. Omojua. Um, it talks about digital businesses in every area, governance, faith, um, um, social media marketing, in, you know, everything that you can think around digital and what you need to do in building a digital business or advocacy and activism. You know, if you work in development space, how to leverage digital to do this. Um, it's also a great book. I recommend that you um, should get a copy. Um, and read. So these are some of the recommended texts. Please join the community. You can reach me um, if you would like to get some more information on which community to join. I know the Bridge Leadership Foundation has a vibrant community like this series, for instance, in COVID-19. It's one that you can be a part of. Find tools. There are tools online. There are tools everywhere. And then if you, if you feel that you still need some support, I recommend that you go for some training that would really, so, I mean, a lot of the things I said, as I mentioned, I couldn't go into them in detail, um, but at a training, you'll be able to achieve this, um, yeah, and, and really learn the basics of program design and management. So I'd like to say thank you to the Bridges Foundation, my TBLF family, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to share, um, learn, and contribute my little quota to your success. Um, I would like to thank all the participants who joined in and have stayed up until this point. I look forward to meeting you all at one point or the other or engaging with you um, in the near future. So thank you for, for your time and for inviting me. I think I'll hand over now to... Um, I'll hand over now okay. to Indy. I can't find him. Hello. I have a question. I don't know if uh -huh. I can just go on. Martha, your question is coming after wrapping up. How now? Where were you all along? <laughs> Emilia, do you want to take the question? I, I was just trying to... Martha, hold on. Emilia, do you want to take the question? I mean, I would like that, let that be your decision. <laughs> let that be your decision. If you ask me to take it, I'll take it. If not, then we can take it off, offline. I know we've kept you longer than necessary. Uh, okay, we'll just let, okay, please just indulge, indulge us. Let us just take it longer. Sorry. Okay. All right, thank you. Right. Mata, go ahead. Okay, go thank ahead. you. I... I did not know that and um, that was the final wrap up. So um just quickly I wanted to ask um that I, I was stumbling a little on um programming when it has to do with um quality control. Now um if you are faced with a program that you are already implementing and um, at some point you are faced with a crisis like, like the one we are in now, COVID-19, 
and um, you you got to bring out some new strategies and then um, you're able to sell it to your target audience let's say youth and um, older adults younger adults and they seem not to be buying into the idea you know and it's it's more it's more like um they are not seeing possibilities that it's going to work okay now in that case you are first talked with continuing the delivery of your services because yeah. your target audience are um you are having just them um, let's say two percent of your target audience that are buying into your new strategy that you are bringing in so in that case what do you do do you get to suspend your implementation or you get to drop it you know because especially when the situation is uncertain i don't know if um I think it's it's a bit similar to what um, I discussed earlier. So if you have two percent of your target audience who are buying into your new strategy, then it's obviously not a good strategy. Two percent is too small a number to risk um, um, resources on. So I would say that you in in asking them whether they buy into. So again, um, when you are dealing with program strategy, you have to try as much as possible to use what I call systems thinking. So think about all the you know, possible relationships um, and the, the linkages and you know, interconnectedness of one issue with another. But yeah. whilst you are yeah. asking them about whether they buy into your idea, you should use that opportunity to ask them what they want. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? If not, you would ask them what they think about your idea you find out that you only have two percent buying, then you have to go back and ask them what they want, so that you can, do you understand? You can develop what they want. So whilst you ask them about whether they buy into your new idea, you use that same opportunity to ask them what they would want or what they think they need, or what they need at that point. So when you, by the time you are analyzing your results, you find out that only two percent want what you want or what you have designed, then that's a fail then you look at the new data that you have, which tells you the things that they need or the things that they want at the time, and you work from there. If not, I would recommend that you suspend the program until when things get back to normal. But the challenge with that is we don't know when. Yeah, yeah. So it might be end of this year, it might be next year, but if you read from the Spanish flu and past similar incidents between 1918 and 1920, it tells you that Usually it takes about two years for us to get back to normal. Now, can you wait for two years? It's a question you need to ask yourself. Or do you really just want to um, adapt to what your targets want or need and then um, be able to impact their lives at the same time? Okay, thank you, Amir. So I don't know if I answered your question. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Matt, okay, I think Martha is fine. All right, Emilia, once again, thank you so very much. Uh, we really appreciate the time you've spent with us. Uh, so much knowledge shared. We hope to take the next uh, weeks to digest on them and see how we can apply it to come out better with our designs of programs and how we can leverage on. But I think one key thing for me, which you mentioned is, uh, I mean, there are certain areas we just need to accept that no matter how, what strategy we come up with, it won't change. So let's, <laughs> let's be open. Yeah, no, no, it's very key. Let's be open, guys. We just need to be open to the fact that certain things may need to stop completely. Certain things we'll just need to, you know, go back to our drawing board and come out with them afresh. They've never existed before. We just have to pull them out from somewhere. And then some other things may take some time, but we just need to keep, you know, the communication gap and keep responding and, you know, and keep working at it. Thank you so very much, Emilia. We appreciate your time and we wish you all the best. We'll see you on the other side. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so for guys, uh, if you enjoyed that session very well, uh, we just want to take a few minutes to give us your feedback. I've shared with us in a chat, uh, the chat box, you see the feedback form, okay? We, we like, we appreciate your feedback, so please give us uh, uh, your feedback. Uh, just take the next two, three minutes to do that.
uh, provide us with how you think the session went and what you think we can do better, what you learned newly, and most importantly, what you'll be doing after now. We have other series planned out uh, for, for, for our audience, and we hope that you'll be part of it soon, either sometime next week or in two weeks' time.